the biggest challenge is understanding. Understanding the, the value of openness, uh, understanding how it works, how you can generate business out of it, understanding, uh, uh, um, well, not falling in all into misconceptions and not, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, false information or, or uh, misconceptions around. So that I think that somebody here mentioned it's a journey understanding it, and I just said that I, I had at least 10 years journey for understanding different things and, and uh, uh, that journey, I think everybody has started that journey, but, but, but people need to understand that they, they will uh, need to start embark on the journey and learn little by little more, more on this. So, and on the concrete example, I think the GPL license, and then people think the GPL license is viral and it's, it, it does uh, uh, all bad things automatically uh, as itself. And, uh, and that's just completely, uh, completely nonsense from a legal point of view. And uh, uh, that's something I'm, I'm discussing still today all the time. And uh, um, yeah, that's... That's uh, uh, my my view on, on on the most difficult subject, most okay. the well, largest challenge. Yes. What about Ilka? Trust. Uh, I wonder if it's. Can you hear Ilka's speech? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can. So trust. Okay. Creation of trust. Uh, we we hear about uh, trust in many different uh, forums and discussions. Whether it's about the privacy and how the consumers can trust different companies. But in terms of bringing companies together and working on that kind of a single vision that I mentioned for the PPP, for instance, it took a lot of discussions and a lot of meetings and a lot of things where you actually came up with an approach that everyone trusted each other. I'm not saying that it's 100% yet still, mm -hmm. but still at least we are at the stage where we can say that we know at least what is the agenda of that person, and then we are able to come up with a strategy that benefits for both of us. In a sense. Yes, I, I think that relates to, to the uh, fact that Martin mentioned in his presentation yes. that, that I guess this trust is especially important in these open source communities. And as you said, if you're active in the community, uh, you will have less adversaries, for example. So, so in that, that sense, if you're a trusted uh, contributor in the community, then, then, uh, <coughs> then uh, everything works more smoothly. That's, that's correct, but I'd say that even more importantly, it's, it, it's trust inside the organizations and companies embarking on this journey uh, or, or taking their decisions and uh, uh, un, uh, for them to gain trust, they need to understand how uh, how uh, uh, the relationships work, how uh, uh, personal relationships work, but also how legal relationships work. What are the what are the bottom level underpinnings from a legal sense when when you go on? I think that um, that from my perspective, that's that's even more difficult, uh, um, but. But both are both exist. Yeah, kind of what comes to my mind is that trust can only be built on kind of mutual understanding. Yes. So that kind of combines your yeah. points, maybe. Yeah, and perhaps then also mutual understanding doesn't need to be that they have the same understanding. The, 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 uh, uh, actors can have totally different uh, um, targets, what they wish wish to achieve. But still, they need to. They can understand each other's targets and understand that hey, this joint um, way of working will help. Well, that will help you achieve your target and me achieve my mm. target. But we don't. Those targets don't like undermine each other, or they, they can be worked towards at the same time. So, so most I think companies have like they may have very different objectives when they when they do. But but that doesn't bother. That it's 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 okay. <coughs> Okay, what about Tumas? So what do you see, for example, from Etsimo's point of view as the, as the biggest challenge of open innovation or openness? Well, I have just started my journey. Is this on? It should be. Okay, yeah, just so you hear me all right. Uh, so I don't actually know a lot. Uh, my question would maybe be to, to, to Ilka and Martin regarding the openness of data because uh, 
The biggest challenges I have is uh, when I look for information that I know exists, and I want to find that information because that would answer my question I, and I wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. So for, for a person who has done a lot of work to answer a question or to provide information to build a research report or, or gather a da data set, if he puts it out in the open for, for everyone to use, and it's not of such a nature that you can build software or hardware from mm -hmm. it or, or, or give support, what would be the incentive for the, the creator of the data to, to actually give it up for free? Be because I have nothing against paying for data if it's useful for me, but first I have to find it, and uh, secondly I need to somehow evaluate that this report is actually worth $3,600 mm. before I buy it, preferably. Mm. Any comments on that, Martin or Ilka? I can, well, if you pick the traditional business models, you get your money either from software as a proprietary license or then you get your money out of, out of a service utilizing data. Uh, but, but now you are actually, well, you are saying that you are putting data, if you would put data into open, then you are getting that out. Or then you get money out of having a brand and an ecosystem around the brand and uh, uh, people working around that. So, so if, if we take the data out of the equation, what remains is the software or the brand at least um, of course one could think of that if you could create a hub for the data the best hub for the data in the world and then uh, that would mean that others would also want to contribute data into that hub uh, so that they would be part of that best data set and uh, uh, and then that could mean a great brand and there could be a lot of tools proprietary tools or, or non-proprietary tools to work on top of that data and if you had a great brand and you had a marketplace then perhaps selling those tools via that marketplace will, could, could generate value or, or then you could have consulting services on top of that or, or uh, um, uh, well, some, some thoughts, whether they work on, in your case or not, uh, well, that's up to you, but, but, but uh, uh, some, some thoughts on how, uh, how that could be addressed. Well, yeah, I, I think that's exactly what, when you look from the kind of a firm and business point of view, what are the areas you can actually build or shape and create the market by putting it in there. And especially when you're not using the core information that you would like to keep yourself for the, for the advantage as such. Mm -hmm. uh, but from the individual point of view, I, I, I kind of understood your question to be part of that as well. So uh, there is actually a person there in the audience, Keijo Helianko, who is, who is an authority, I, I think, on the kind of the peer-to-peer -peer brand recognition and the yeah two different things that people get. So the incentive that they get by contributing into the open source development is that you get recognition. You, you, you get kind of a peer-to-peer uh, -peer recognition from your peers that, that you are a smart guy. Right. So that, that, that's one, one of those areas, for instance, where, where I do see it from the individual perspective as such. But for businesses, clearly, you can, you can shape the market, you can be a, a front runner by doing it in, in, in certain cases. Hmm. Okay, what about Sami? Yeah, I could go back to Martin's presentation. Can, about can you use the microphone, please? Yeah. Uh, about Matti Rossi's slides. Actually, they were my, Ma Matti <laughs> borrowed my slide from my <laughs> pre presentation. Sorry. And then there were three uh, things, vendor lock-in, transparency and quality control. And from my uh, information systems development uh, and da support. data quality system development perspective, uh, those were the good parts. But the challenge for openness is that actually there's many incentives and mechanis mechanisms for vendor locking. And many people want and companies want to create the vendor lock. There's business models like proprietary rights, there is uh, copyrights, there is all kind of mechanisms that try to close and not allow sharing. And uh, in the same way, uh, the transparency is a good part of open, openness. But there is a lot of in incentives and mechanisms for closing. Not everybody wants to see their all data open 
or they don't want to see their errors being public, or there's many things that uh, encourage closeness, or and don't encourage actually transparency. And same way in quality control. Of course, people want good quality and uh, would benefit from quality control, but when things go wrong, well, they don't want to actually open these errors so they could be fixed, they hide it. So these three are actually the big challenges for openness, but at the same time, openness is a solution, at least a one step for solving these problems. Okay, any comments on that? Okay, we can then, then move on to the possibilities. So, so, of course, there are many possibilities and many benefits that we have discussed already today from open, open innovation, open science, data access uh, perspectives. But uh, if you would have to name uh, a single kind of a low hanging fruit that we could, a possibility that we should now target our efforts at, uh, uh, what what would it be, the most important possibility? Mm. You're asking hard questions. Yes, <laughs> <coughs> Martin. I don't know whether it's the most important one, but one great advantage is the the you are instantly global in a way when mm. you do uh, something in the open. You get yeah you. If you do it, well, it doesn't mean that you get users or, or followers or, or customers or acceptance by, do, by, by, not by itself, but it means that you're by publishing something and do, if you do it in a, in a good way, you are instantly giving the globe access to your work what you are doing and then if you build on top of that with decent marketing and with decent uh, uh, contacting and uh, 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 so y you get far cheap you have a far cheaper way to achieve a global well if it's a mar company and you're doing business global market if you're a researcher and you're doing science then uh, the global uh, um, uh, global yeah, research audience. Uh, once once you have uh, have that in the open, and, and you must remember, I think, in the science side at least, if we look at the whole population in worldwide, I think that access to certain type of publications and certain type of data is quite limited. If we think about in terms of of the f full population worldwide, so and also perhaps more complex questions that. If you have tools for doing science or tools for doing uh, uh, um, research, or you have data sets for research, the, uh, those can't be published via, via journals. Those has to be published otherwise. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, g those also could become instantly global. In this. Yes. Maybe, maybe as a follow up, I, I think everything that Martin said is very valid. So in the sense that the um, what are the benefits and being global being one of those benefits. Uh, <clears throat> I'm currently chairing an ETLA work on platform economy. And, and basically what we're looking there are things like what are the benefits, the economic benefits of openness and how it actually look, works together in, in, in how the working life and the firms as organizations and so forth, how those are changing. So the, the, the whole idea of work of the future, what it will mean and what type of jobs there are in the future and, and, and that. And usually when you do that type of work, a reporter or a journalist comes to you and say that this means usually that you're losing one third of all the jobs in a country. And we try to explain that that's not what we are after in this type of a research, but what we are actually trying to uh, explain and, 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 and build some understanding or better understanding is that by using openness, by using digital technologies, by using all these different tools, you are actually regenerating your economy in, in a way that we need to now do because we are at the stage currently in Finland where one road has been traveled to the end and we have to embark on a different road and a different path 
uh, for the future. And, and this is where openness helps us greatly. I think that's, that's one of the keys. What about Thomas and Sami? Do you have any, any kind of notes on the possibilities Just side? Just saying the same thing, but in a different way. If, <laughs> if everybody is building Lego blocks, Instead of just you, you can use everybody else's Lego blocks, and, and it, in theory, you should be able to develop stuff much faster. That, that's the low-hanging fruit that I <laughs> actually have thought of. Yeah, well, I have my own notes about this also, and it's uh, these open <coughs> platforms and open tools uh, that uh, scientists should actually d don't just uh, rely on publishing papers. It's not so important what the paper is. You should actually open the method how you created it. And if it's reproducible, if it's verifiable, it, it re if it really works, it's not just your paper, but it, your system works, then that should be opened in a way. And that's, it's uh, not actually low hanging fruit in that sense that it will change the whole way of doing science, mm. the whole mm. way of uh, what we think as a science. But ma actually many disciplines are doing this, like uh, f physics and uh, uh, genetics. They are qu quite a long way in front of some other disciplines. But I think this opening the methods, tools, platforms, uh, not exactly only the publications or, or results, because the result of publication is a black box. You don't know what exactly is behind that. Okay, then <coughs> I once read a story about this uh, uh, US boy, teenager, who had used Google to, to develop some sort of advanced cancer uh, uh, test or cancer uh, treatment. Uh, so that can be seen as a kind of a, a side effect of open science, that it enables this kind of a citizen science that truly anybody can utilize, for example, the research results. Do you have any, uh, uh, in your experience, do you have any, any uh, similar type of stories that kind of truly demonstrate the, the possibilities of openness and especially open science that you have heard of? Hmm. Well, I can start a couple of, uh, <coughs> I don't know if it's really open science, but uh, these cata uh, natural catastrophes like uh, uh, Catherine hurricane or or these kind of things. There is uh, interesting publications how op opening, uh, how open data or open information around the internet and social media has been used to organize and self-organize uh, citizen activism during this. So that, uh, that, that these kind of things uh, are really good examples what you can do with or open publicly, publicly available information. And then one of data quality researchers that uh, I'm familiar with, my own research, they are doing citizen science from bird watching. So uh, they try to build systems how globally people could uh, uh, provide better information about birds for biologists. But the problem is that because they are citizens, they are not experts in actually recognizing all the different species. So the quality of recognizing each species can vary. But these citizen sciences and uh, these catastrophe helps, they are really interesting cases. Mm. Any other exp examples? Thomas? Well, I'm not sure if this is open science either, but uh, the EU's Joint Research Center, they gather medical articles from around the globe, and I'm not talking about research article, but, uh, articles, but articles from the local tabloids, for example, Iltalehti and uh, whatever they have in, in, in the middle, mi middle of Africa. And uh, there was a software developed at the University of Helsinki, who could, which could uh, go through these tabloid articles and predict epidemics based on, on what people have written in, in the local newspapers. And this was basically four to six weeks faster than relying on the normal channels because the normal channels requires a doctor to see it, a doctor to see a, a few more patients, and after that he might or might not uh, 
tell this to his superior who then might or might not take this onwards and so forth. So this was basically an online system that could predict, for example, Ebola epidemics much faster than, than the normal channels, and it was built on, on, on joint data. Come on, this one. <laughs> so I, I, I think very good examples. I'm, I don't know, for some reason, being an economist, I'm always thinking about <laughs> that type of remarks or, or examples of such. Uh, there, there was a case a couple months ago, I was in a, in a meeting where people were bringing out the open data possibilities and ideas how it could be used. And, and, and one of them actually started from the late 19th century telling how a doctor in the UK went from house to house to get feedback on a specific illness. And through that actually came up with the theory that what was the cause of, 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 of smallpox. And, and, and through that also started to create treatments for that. So that's kind of a classic case of open data gathering and those. Uh, in, in real time, so in our, our time, in modern times, the city of Manchester will be using sensors that are everywhere, as we all know. Uh, everyone is carrying them with them uh, to create a model for smart investment. So based on how much certain areas are being used and where you have traffic, whether it's cars or individuals or bicycles or whatever, uh, they, they can do more accurate planning on where to lay the next uh, building or bridge or those type of activities to kind of give more real-time understanding on where the money is actually going from the city side. I think that's very interesting. And from the economist point of view, that, that would be very good because if you could use that sensor data also to do economic forecasting for specific urban centers or regions or those type of things, since we're now all basing on historical data, but it will actually get more real-time understanding on consumption patterns, for instance. That's one, one other area. Well, perhaps a more general observation. I think that <coughs> when you're opening up something, if you think of a scientific tool or, or, or such, uh, I think if, if that requires a lot of work or effort <coughs> to do that, and, and likely that's a way by getting benefit out of it. I, I think that a prudent one would, pl a prudent publishing strategy would in a way plan for certain successes. Uh, uh, in a plan for what, what do I wish to accomplish with publishing this at least? What do I wish? And then you strive and then you do actions to, to get that. But at the same time, uh, uh, one of the, the sought benefits always is, is also to get these unplanned, unplanned uh, reactions and unplanned uh, uh, um, contacts and uh, uh, possibilities. And, and in a way, even if they are unplanned, they are still expected. So uh, one should build it in a way that, that you also get these uh, not very well planned uh, benefits out of it. Uh, uh, but but it, it would still, in order to get those not very well planned benefits, it's often beneficial to, 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 to plan one benefit very clearly and, and, and make it sure that it'll, uh, uh, you can accomplish it by by doing a little bit preparation in advance and, and doing perhaps with a colleague you know and agreeing with him in advance that we will do this and this to promote in a way uh, the, the, the solution. And, and uh, from this point of view, in a way, the, the unexpected or the not, not planned benefits, they, they, are, they are to be expected. That's, that's one of the benefits that you are in general you are going, go, going after. But but, but you don't yet know will it be exactly a contact from South Africa or will it be, will it be a developer from Russia or will it be someone from your neighbor, uh, someone for, for, from your neighbor, neighbor, uh, uh, neighboring office or, or neighbor next house next door. So um, that's, a, that's a phenomenon that, or that, that one should try to uh, get to work to your own benefit. So, so uh, uh, and that's something that you should a little bit prepare for and, and, and then, uh, then be ready to enjoy, enjoy in a way, the, the rewards. Okay, thank you. <coughs> yeah, I guess we could take one question from the audience now. So, uh, was there any questions that the audience would like to ask the panelists? If not, 
Then we can continue. Ah, okay, Anne. <coughs> The, um, of the ministry is that Finland is the, uh, the leading country of openness by 2017. How realistic do you think that this aim is? And if we are sort of aiming there, and as we are aiming there, what, what should be done that we get there? Just as a side note, that's actually uh, exactly the question ah, I was okay. asking. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, okay, planning to ask, but yeah, great we, that we it came think out, different, so. <laughs> yes. similar way then. <laughs> Yeah, so just to recap, so, so according to the ATT uh, goals, Finland should be the leading, leading country for openness in science and research by 2017 and extensively utilize the opportunities afforded by open science in the Finnish society. So what has to happen for these goals to be achieved? Hmm. <laughs> okay, um, if I go first. Yes, please. So <laughs> that's a good goal. First of all, so I, I think we have to be uh, showing that we are the leaders in taking the benefits out of out of openness and open sciences. And we, we have a good track record. So Finland is, is one of those countries that is considered to be obviously in, in the field of education and, and many other fields still to be a front runner, even if when you read the newspaper you wouldn't think so. But we're still still number ones in, in many of those fields. And I, I think what needs to happen is that we are very, we, we heard several times the, the word transparent, uh, that we have to be transparent also to what happens in other countries and we have to do it cooperatively with them so that we don't only say that Finland alone is the leader in a sense, but we have to get a group of like-minded countries to kind of a join, join the pack or or, or kind of a, get a better emphasis on, on the idea that it's not only Finland, but it's other countries. Uh, then, uh, again, maybe, maybe, maybe the, the thing is that I, w I wouldn't scare away from being very uh, aggressive in the marketing of that. I, I would be very, very actually starting to bang the drum already and saying that we are the leaders and we, we are actually paving the way to what open science and openness means for societies, even if that we don't yet know what the end, end result of that is. That's what I would say. And at least according to uh, Antti Rose's presentation, the, the statistics about Alto professors show that the potential is there to yeah. you know, open up the, uh, the, the publications and, and the publishers allow this as well. Are there any other thoughts? What concrete actions should we do yeah, I think it goes back to this publishing these methods and way of working. And that's actually, uh, well, if we want to publish our methods of working, we have to do them much better than we are doing it right now. Uh, it's not enough that you manage to do something and you, then you write the black box publication out of it. You have to dare to open how you did it and let whole the, the whole world see it. And uh, that requires additional work, that it can be repeated, and uh, others can repeat it. So I think this me methodological development and systematic way of doing research, it has to be improved quite significantly. It's not about uh, open access. I don't care so much about open access. I'd like to see the open methodology, open way of working. Any thoughts, Martin? Yeah, a little bit out of my uh, field of activity, but I think that here is two different, two different aspects. One is building the psychology, which <coughs> Ilka here yeah. actually said that, hey, let's start banging already the drum. And the other thing is building the practice, which is what, <laughs> what Sami, Sami, <laughs> Sami said here just. And, uh, 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 I think that also how do we measure this type of goal if if we really want to achieve something then we need to perhaps well the public goal can be that but then we need to perhaps reduce the goal into a little bit more concrete sets that we want to have this and this many new whatever and, and then we measure whether we get those 
uh, um, so I'd say that uh, supporting um, a program where they would support researchers to to create or to publish their tools, uh, uh, as Sami said, uh, uh, what they are using um, would be a concrete action. And another program about the marketing would be a concrete action. Uh, and uh, still, I would also want to say, w regarding these tools, uh, what Sami's proposition, I think that's a very valid and great observation. And uh, I'd like to make a point here that there is an option possibility that a scientist can become the world leader in his domain if he is able to create a tool that everybody else wants to use. And, and if he is able to maintain, or he actually he needs a group of scientists likely, uh, uh, or, or an institute, if he's able to maintain that tool and, and uh, uh, do that, he, he can become the leader. If, everybody want, if it's a great tool and others are using it, then others will come to him and ask, that, hey, could we add this type of methodology also to this, to this great tool? And he will stay on top of what happens all everywhere in the world. And, uh, and that's, in a way, something we should... Uh, we should uh, uh, strive for an, an openness born global in a way on a tool set site level uh, uh, allows that and uh, um, and like bold initiatives which don't require very much actions on the ground but 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 bold initiatives should be there as as also very uh, uh, grass level initiatives about educating people. I, I was speaking about the challenge of understanding. Mm. Uh, that is perhaps on the business side, but but I like I think that the understanding likely also is a question about uh, um, the, the in 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 the science field too. There is perhaps not not so much, but 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 I know of scientists who think what's what's the benefit for me in this. The, I know that this funder requires me to do this but 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 how how does it benefit me and 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 going through that from uh, what are the benefits and what are the in a transparent and what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks and how can you play that game uh, uh, correctly that's also grassroots in a way education uh, and there's perhaps uh, uh, some some ideas okay yeah, I, well yeah quick co comment yes so from somewhere well, I learned a few, few weeks ago that actually uh, it's Technical University of München has uh, included uh, open science or openness of research as a recruitment criteria for doctoral students and uh, researchers. So actually not only they count publications, but uh, they asked that how this publication was opened or your, how, how your research opens your methods. And actually Alta should also uh, bring in recruitment and uh, financial incentives <coughs> for this o doing open tools, open platforms, and forget the papers. Actually, recruit those who do actually good research, tools, methods, regardless of the publications. Okay, thank you. I guess we're running already more than 10 minutes over the schedule, so so at this point, I would like to thank, you, th thank the speakers, the panelists, and also the other, other presenters from today for, for a very successful event. And maybe as a take-home message from this panel, I could say that maybe, yeah, let's all go and bang the drum of open science and open innovation and, and, and try to kind of get things rolling from the grassroots rev level. So thank you very much and have a nice trip back home. Thank you.